Well, you probably are not going to celebrate the topic of today's message. Questions people ask about God and the Bible. How can I overcome temptation? Well, the young priest was learning all the things of ministry, and it came the day when he needed to do his first day of taking confessions. All of y'all know about priests and confessions. Let me, let me tell you something. This is a joke. Be ready. It always bothers me when I tell a joke and y'all don't laugh. So I want you to know it's coming. Laugh just for me. If you Just do it for mine. Just be kind to me. But the, the young priest is taking confessions. And the older priest is sitting close enough to listen in so that he can help instruct the young priest on how to be better at this particular task of ministry. So at the end of the day, he calls the young man into his office and he says, Son, you did a pretty good job. He says, But you've got to learn to say something to the confessor other than, Wow! Good. Thank you for laughing. I appreciate that. <laughs> Our text today comes to us from Paul in his writings to the believers at Corinth. You know what a immoral, godless city Corinth was. If you ever think you're in a bad church, I always encourage you, just read the book of Corinthians. Man, you're talking about a mess. They had bunches of messes. And Paul was trying to write to them about biblical truths and nonetheless this issue about temptation. And we read in verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 10 these words. It's kind of sandwiched into a unique context and we'll look at that. But let's read this text. It says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. Now, what that means is that when you're tempted and I'm tempted and you are tempted and I am tempted, uh, there's nothing new under the sun. And hopefully today, by the time we get through this text, you'll realize how true that statement is. Uh, it is a biblical statement, by the way. It's not one I made up. There is nothing new under the sun. And temptation is as old as the Garden of Eden and the first man and the first woman and the first failure. Just like you and I have failed many times at temptation. But he tells the believers there, there's no temptation that's overcome you except what is common to mankind. And God, oh, underline that, that is hope. God is what? Faithful. Even if you become faithless, God is what? Faithful. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Oops. The devil didn't make you do it. You chose to do it. And God gave you a way out, and you and I didn't take it. He'll not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. This morning, how can I overcome temptation? Pray with me. Father, today, temptation is a real part of everyone's life. And if most folks knew what we should and have confessed, they would probably say like the young priest, wow. And yet it's not funny. It's painful. We ought to weep and mourn over our sin especially when we have a God that's loved us enough not only to give us a way out, but live in such a way to show us a way out. And I pray today that we would understand better from your word how we can overcome temptation by seeing the failures in the first Adam and the successes in the second. So, Father, today, let us hear from you and from your word. I pray it in Jesus' name. 
Now, there's two verses, while you have your finger there in 1 Corinthians 10, that I want to point out to you because they're very similar, but yet they conclude with two different remarks. So go back to verse 6 in chapter 10, and it says this, Now, these things occurred... And this is a reciting of some difficulties that were a part of the children of Israel after the Exodus experience. And Paul's using their history to teach them that God recorded this as an example. He says, now these things occurred as examples to keep you from setting your hearts on evil things. Now, you're going to have some words that sound a lot like that in verse 11. So turn over to verse 11 which is right before our text, and it says, These things happen to them as examples. Now, there it is again. Now, why this time? They happened as examples and were written down as warnings. So there's two things that Paul is saying to the believers at Corinth as a reason for why he was, by the inspiration of the Spirit, writing these things down and sending them to the believers in Corinth. One was to keep them from setting their minds and hearts on evil things and to warn them that when you choose to follow the temptation of life, there is consequence. 3,000 one time, 23,000 died another time, and we don't need an explanation of the carnage of sin because we've lived it, have we not? We certainly have. Now, there is something I want to clarify for you. If you go to the text, it's always designed that the word for temptation and the word for test in the Greek language is the same word. The context determines whether you translate it temptation or test. Now, why is that? Because the Bible clearly tells us that God doesn't tempt anyone, but God does test us. A temptation follows the character and the person of the tempter. And the scripture clearly tells us what that character is. The evil one comes to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. And I can promise you, if in your sinful nature you choose to follow his temptation, it will do all three of those things in your life. But in the life of Jesus, in the life of the Lord God, he tests us to make us more durable and stronger so that in the time of crisis we can stand and continue to stand. So it's important that we understand this thing about temptation and how it might be overcome just as surely as John 16, 33 says that he will give us the power to overcome because he's overcome what? The world which means he's overcome the evil one and the prince and the power of this earth. And if he lives in you and he lives in me, there is hope if we'll just learn about how to overcome temptation. Now, I also took this and placed it in kind of a parallel between the first Adam and the second Adam. The first Adam would be the first man, and the second Adam, of course, as we know, is Jesus. And so kind of keep that in mind as we walk through it. But then let me paint the situation a little bit better as the context. Now, as I kept reading these things, and, and this, it says, these things happen, it's just in me to say, what things? Do y'all ever do that? You, you, it says, these things, and sometimes we just read right through. We don't pay any attention to the pronouns and their antecedents, and we go back... Y'all didn't know I knew that, did you? You go back and you look at what the pronoun refers to. What were these things? And there's actually four of them. He lists them for us. And I want to give them to you very quickly. Following verse 6, it was idolatry, sexual immorality. It was unbelief or testing God, not really believing God, and grumbling. See, when we doubt God's person and character, then we fuss about what he tells us to do. And that's because we're so proudful as the creature, we think we know better than the creator. And where that takes us in our pride is off down the road to put something else in the place of God and then to follow the desires and passions of our life. 
And so there's really three things that he's looking at. And we're going to find out how unique that is, even as we look at the life of Jesus, because he was what? Tempted and always like as we, yet without sin. So he becomes our model, and we become our example. So we look at the first one. And I want to read what is basically the statement for today, the proposition, which is temptation is a reality. Anybody in here doubt that? Temptation is a reality. And it's a reality that you and I, that one can resist. When you and I stay obedient to God or rely on God and His Word. And I believe we're going to find that to be true when we finish the text today and its example. So let's go to point one. Temptation is a reality. Now, in Corinthians, Paul said it's what? Common. That means it's in your life and it's in my life. It's common to all of us. So in 13a, we find that like the believers in Corinth who had all of this stuff in their life, in their church, in their city, and in... Their, ex, their experience, we too have it in our life, in our cities, and in our experiences. The second thing we find out is that that temptation, according to the first Adam, not only was it there for them in, in the garden, uh, he was crafty. Now, if you go to Genesis 3.15, you may say, well, you know, you've not cited that correctly, but I want you to look at what happens at one point in time because of the perfect life of the second Adam, the head of the evil one, which is symbolized for us in Genesis as a what? Oh, good, you're getting it. Snake, sign language, y'all get that? Snake. Be, did, did any of you see the passion of Christ? And he, what did he do? He stomped the head of the snake. In a very literal gesture, he was doing what that text said. But what was the snake going to do? Get the heel. I don't know what you know about Greek mythology. It always amazes me the truths that I find sometimes there that are paralleled in biblical text. I want to give you one of these. Thetis was a goddess who didn't want her son to experience mortality. So she took him and dipped him in the river's sticks that flowed from the fires and the depths of hell. Y'all know this story? And she reaches out and she grabs him with her thumb and her index finger and dips him in the sticks river to make him, what? Immortal. Now what did she have him by? his Achilles tendon, right? So we know from the tragedy written about Troy that Paris kills Achilles by shooting him with an arrow in the one place that didn't get covered in the dipping. And it becomes known as your Achilles heel. Now when you think about your Achilles heel, if you follow modern interpretation, and I think it's the correct meaning, what you're talking about is your weak spot. Your weak spot. Where is it that the devil's going to come? I think he's going to come for you at your weak spot. I have, you know, folks that, men, <laughs> we got a bunch of weak spots. This is Father's Day. Let's talk about a weak spot. 25% of all hits on the Internet. Do y'all know this? 25% of all hits on the internet are pornography. I'd say that's a pretty large Achilles heel for males who are the largest number of the population hitting that site. But ladies, you're close in the 30 percentile of that 25. So it's going on everywhere. Now, I also notice in movies, in things that I'm watching, there is this one particular word. It has become the dominant word. It is a word that starts with a certain letter. I'm not going to mention it, but all of you already know what I'm talking about. 
If you took it out of your vocabulary, most of y'all would reduce your speech by 30%. And I know because I have boys and I have talked to them about this. In fact, I had one. I didn't use this this morning. And I've told him and I've gone to him and he's come back to live with us. I mean, I heard him in the other end of the house using this word. And I went in there and I said, I asked you to stop using that word in my house. You know, it, it's just not a good word. Now, I can't really appreciate that because, you see, for me to cuss, I have to intentionally choose to do it. That's not my way. Now, you bring Twinkies by me, I can't resist them. <laughs> <laughs> you, know? And, and, you know? We all have weak spots, don't we? Every one of us. And I'm telling you, this, this generation with uh, electronics and games... It's like another appendage, and us old folks are catching on. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm lost if my phone's not working. And I can remember when we didn't have this. That's how old I am. I, I'm not old enough to have been on a party line, but close. But, but, you know, things have changed, and it's not just the use of the phone and the Internet and that kind of thing. It's all these games. In fact, that's what I was getting on to him last night about. He's in there playing a video game. And he's cussing the TV set. And I said, have you lost your mind? He said, Dad, that's why I turned it off. I said, good decision. <laughs> it's everywhere. And Satan is crafty. And he's going to give it in every single weak place in your life and in mine. Well, that's the first Adam. It's common, it's crafty. And that passage out of, Gen out of James just really hammers home. Look over there uh, at that in the book of James. And it, it's the one that just takes all the zip out of us. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. So that puts God what, off the hook. And this puts us on the hook. Look at verse 14. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their... Are y'all looking at the text? By their own. He can tempt you, but he's not responsible for you choosing the temptation. That's why Baptists doctrinally and biblically sound believe we're sinners by nature and by choice choose it. Thus we are accountable to God for it. And we'll see how that plays out when Paul writes to another group of believers. But in this first one, it is common. It is crafty. It is based on self-centeredness. But when it comes to the second Adam, thank God we have a high priest who understands our predicament. Because if you go to Luke 4 and 1, he's taken out into the wilderness. He's full of the Holy Spirit. He is at the beginning of his ministry, and yet he is still what? Tempted. You see, it's not a measure of your spirituality. It's a measure of the reality of the evil one and what's going to come in our life. And so the first point we need to realize is that it is a reality. Temptation is a reality. It comes to all of us. And no matter how much someone tries to cover us, there's always that weak spot where we have vulnerability. And you have one. And if you're like me, you have more than one. <laughs> Most of us have multiples. So the second thing is, it is a reality one can resist. Now, the first man and the first woman, just like your sin and mine, testifies to the fact that we don't resist. If you go back to the book of Genesis and you look in chapter 3, verses 1 through 13, you'll find this story about the fall of man where we're in a garden and everything is perfect. Is there anybody in here who's perfect? You know, I, I think about within my own physical self. I've never been perfect. There was always something I did. Now there's a lot now I don't like, but it used to be there was less when I was the age of some of you, you know, when I was an athlete in shape and all this kind of stuff. I, I, you know, but there's always something you don't like. There's just no perfectness. 
And so they are in something we don't understand, a perfect world with perfect situations. They only have one thing they're asked or told not to do. That tree in the center of the garden, the one of wisdom, knowledge of good and evil, said, don't eat from that tree. The day you eat from that tree, you're going to what? You're going to die. Now, we know that they ate, right? And we know they didn't drop dead. So there's more meaning to the word to die than to physically die. And boy, that's where sin really takes its toll is when you have a dying situation while you're still alive. And of course, this is a spiritual metaphor for us. But how did she get there? Satan has not changed his approach. Now, he may package it different. But he hadn't changed his approach. She looked at the tree, and man, she, oh, that, that is absolutely beautiful. And we always think of it being an apple. We don't know what kind of fruit it was. But whatever it was, it seemed, it wasn't really the fruit, it wasn't really the tree, it was the heart of the individual. It seemed to be what would make her wise. Wisdom is knowledge applied. It seemed that if she knew what she would get, if she ate from that fruit, she would have what she needs to live life the way she thinks it ought to be, which means the evil one has already done what he does is tempt her, and that is to get you to question the character and credentials of God Almighty. It's an identity issue. You see, we just don't like the idea that we're the creature and he's the creator. So the problem was there. And she looked. And as she looked, it says not only did she see it and she longed for it, but it became desirable for giving her wisdom, and so it got into her flesh. Whew, that's when it gets tough. Because you don't only see it want that now you really want it. I can taste the twinkle. I mean, it's just a sermon illustration that I used to be funny. And I mean, I can taste it right now. It is something when it gets inside of you and it won't leave you alone. It's on your mind. It just seems sometimes to possess you. <laughs> that should give you a good idea about where the demonic is in all of this. So not only is it lust of the eye and lust of the flesh, but God put that little indicator in you because he made you in his image and said, mm-mm, don't do that. It looks good, and you really want it. And you decide, I know better than God does. And in the pride of life, you choose it. It does the same thing it did in the garden. Now, guys, <laughs> you want to know why the ladies have trouble trusting us? It started in Eden. We stood right there, watched her go through the whole process, and we didn't say, honey, don't eat that. You know God said don't eat that. We were going to wait and see what happened to her. <laughs> Which would imply it looked good to us too, and we wanted some, and we were listening in. We were just going to let somebody take it. I, I'm telling you, in, in America, it is just unbelievable how true that is. Well... Anyway, lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, pride of life. But then the second Adam. I want you to go with me to the temptation experiences of Jesus. And I want you to underline some things that are very significant in that particular text. So in Luke chapter 4, you will find these words three times in the temptation experience. In verse 3... Underline, if you are. All right? Then go up to verse 7. It is implied part of it is there, if you are. And then the third time, as we come to the last verse in the temptation experience, in verse 9 and 10 and following for its response, if you are. It's a matter of identity. Now, whatever you think about psychology, whatever you think about the triteness of it, listen, our problems rest 
in identity. In who we are and in who he is. And what we want and what he says. And if you get those two confused, you're going to have problems. Now, this temptation experience of our Lord falls in three areas, just like those three areas that come from the four that were sandwiched into our context, idolatry, sexual immorality, and pride. Now notice in the text, every sin comes from one of these three. Notice the first one. Turn the stones into bread. What's that? That's pleasure. That's your physical self. It's the basis of hedonistic behavior in our culture. You know, if it feels good, do it. All these things that we have believed that are what? A lie. And Jesus said, no. I know who I am. I know whose son I am. Not doing that. Was he hungry? Hungrier? I, I, I would dare say there's no one in here that has ever known what this word hungry is. And that's starvation. That's when the body turns on the muscle. It's one of the strongest, if not the strongest drive known to humankind. You will do anything to stay alive. That's where Jesus was at the end of that 40 days. When it says he was hungry, it didn't mean he just wanted something to eat. His body had exhausted all of its fat and it had turned on the tissue and he had a drive like most of us have never known. And it was at that point he said, well, you can do it, just turn them into bread. I'm not going to do that. Why? Because he knew who he was. Now, now think about this. This is Satan's one best shot at defeating Jesus. So he goes to the next one. If it isn't in the pleasure side, flee, feeding the flesh, it's in the power side. If I have what I need, then, you know, I'm insecure because of how I feel about me. How am I going to control it and keep it? So it's a power issue. If you'll bow down and worship me, you know what he said? I'll give you all of this. I'm the prince of the power of the earth. Jesus said, uh-uh, not doing that. The third, well, if you have all you need and you can control everything because you already don't feel good about you, you want everybody to help you feel better about your insecurity about you. So we need a wow principle, don't we? Jump off the pinnacle of the temple. Can you imagine what that would be like, Jesus? You just jump and everybody would see it and, and they wouldn't know what happened, but somebody would swoop you up, you wouldn't even bruise your big toe against a rock. And everybody go, wow, who is this guy? We want prestige. And yet, those three things will never give us what we truly need. Is there any sin that you can name? I, I challenge, college students, I challenge you. Is there any sin you can name that doesn't fall under one of those three categories? I believe that's truly why it says Jesus was tempted in all ways. Like that. Don't forget something else. My wife pointed out that I missed this the first service, and it's so important. Notice, Satan left him until what? Another opportune time. It doesn't go away. You're going to deal with temptation to the day you die and go to glory to be with the Lord. And so it's something we need to know. And Jesus is tempted and always like his we, And yet he does what? How does he resist? By quoting scripture. And of all things, the book of Deuteronomy. You know, the, the, the uh, renewing of the law in the Deuteronomic reform. He goes back and he quotes stale Old Testament scripture. Well, that was the only scripture he had, right? In fact, when the Bible speaks of scripture, it's always speaking of the Old Testament because the New Testament is not written yet. So he quotes Deuteronomy. Not going to do that. We have the first man, his failure, and succumbing to eye, flesh, pride issues. The second man saying, no, no, no. Not to pleasure, not to power. Not, I know who I am. I am the Christ. So he knew who he was. 
But our problem is, because of all of our bad choices, we're uncertain of who we are. Ladies, I quoted this a couple weeks ago. Number one, out of the ten things that ladies have cited as their major problems, the top one is poor self-esteem. And I will do whatever's necessary to make me feel like I have some. Even wrong things. And guys, we're no better. Well, a reality that can be resisted when one relies. Are you relying on God in the midst of temptation? When one relies on God. Well, the first man didn't rely on God. In fact, we read it there in James 1, 14 and 15. He was enticed. He found himself in that enticement desiring, and he ended up in sin, and when sin is full-blown, it brings about death. And down here where we live at the Gulf of Mexico and we go fishing, we take this thing and we put it behind the boat on a line, and it has on the front end of it a duster. Now, they hit different colors depending on where you're at and how deep you're fishing. But the old king mackerel swimming around out there just looking for a meal. And we get his attention. At different depths, you put on different dusters. And then you take an old dead cigar minnow. Stinks, you got three hooks, you hook one right here in his lip. You don't hook it right, it won't run right. But man, I tell you what, Satan is the best rigger out there. He knows how to hook up things. And you put that bait out there at the right depth on the right color with the three hooks and the dead cigar minnow, and you think, man, that is the meal for me. And I love how Chuck Swindoll said, baited, hooked, and fried. He entices you. You go for the bait only to get a mouthful of hooks, and the next thing you know, you're in the frying pan. <laughs> well, temptation is like that for the first Adam because he didn't listen to God. He wasn't faithful to God. In fact... The sin of the first man is common to the sin of all mankind. Now I want you to go with me to the book of Romans. And I want you to find chapter 1. Go with me to the book of Romans and find chapter 1. And I want you to listen to what Paul says as he presents his argument, his polemic for Christ to the believers in Rome. Beginning in verse 18, he says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness. If you don't have God in your life, you have a God in your life, so you're, you're guilty on the first one. you got idolatry in your life. And the wickedness of people who suppress what? Man, yeah, we live in a world that's, oh, there is no truth. It's relative. Hey, you believe that? You're already down the wrong road. There is only one truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. They suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Every one of us said, I've been tempted, i failed. Hey, hey, listen, it's a testimony. Of, when Paul said all of sin, there was no problem with that. Because we know that. It's the truth in our life. Because our life is robbed. We have things that are killing us while we're alive. And we know if it doesn't change, it's only going to get worse. Well, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. Right back up under that adultery again. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. And although they claimed to be wise, you know, I've had a lot of philosophy professors and teachers in the schools that I've had in the 25 years of my education <laughs> that thought they were smarter than God. And I could list you a prefer of carnage in their lives because they thought that and sought to live it. And they're miserable today because of it. 
And although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and they exchanged the glory. That is the very presence of God living in us, the glory of the immortal God for the gods we make ourselves, for images made to look like mortal animals, beings, birds, animals, and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their heart to what? There's the second one, sexual immorality. Gave them over. You know, why is it? Because our identity. Folks, listen. I, you may not like Freud, but at least got this part right. Our identity is found in our understanding of our gender. What is wrong in our culture today? Is it not a gender-confused culture? I mean, now you can check other. Even if you don't know what that is. Just because you don't want to be like everybody else, which means you don't know who you are. They exchanged the truth about God for the lie and they worshiped and served created things rather than the creator. And because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Kind of sounds like that Genesis experience, doesn't it? Because you remember what happened when they sinned and God came looking for them? Adam? Adam, where are you? Well, Lord, I'm hiding. He didn't even have enough sense to, to realize he didn't need to talk back to God. You know, I, I'm, you just don't come to church. He, but he, uh, I'm hiding, God. <laughs> well, what you doing hiding? Have you eaten from that bush, that tree? Uh, yeah. yeah. It's, I was ashamed. I was laid bare. That's what that word really means. And man, that's it. You understand being laid bare? That would be the epitome of feeling not good about yourself. <laughs> and for the first time in their life, they saw that. And as a result, they hid. Always amazed at these shows where they bring that stuff in and everybody, it, you know, after they do the part that they have to do to get that, they, they, they cover themselves up. I'm thinking, what is that? It's right here. It's shame that causes us to hide because we know that what we're doing, we ought not be doing, and we're embarrassed and we don't feel good about ourselves. And shame ultimately is a matter of self-acceptance or the lack of it. And so there's shameful lust. The women exchange their natural sexual relation for the unnatural, and the men abandoned natural that they had for the women and were inflamed with lust for one another. They committed shameful acts. And when the men had received this, they received in their bodies the due penalty and error of their way. Go check that out on STDs in its history and AIDS and how it got into this country and where its genesis was. You can verify it with science what the scripture says. Well, when they did this, God gave them over a third time. Just as they did not think it worthwhile to remain and retain the knowledge of God, God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit. Have you had the news on lately? Does it kind of sound like the culture we live in? Yes, it does. You get to the place where everybody is politically correct and we do what doesn't offend someone else as long as they let me do what I want to do. And when everybody starts doing what's right in their own mind, let me tell you, every single culture known to man that has gone south has followed this exact same path. So you try it biblically and spiritually. You try it psychologically. You try it anthropologically. You can put it every stool of understanding we have in every discipline at our college, and this proves to be true. And that's why we have a mess. 
And that's why your life and mine's a mess is because we listen to the tempter and we take our own simple choices and we do other than what God wants us to do. Well, how depressing. Thank God for the second Adam. <laughs> Thank God for the second Adam. In the book of Timothy, if you go there, you'll find that text. God is faithful. 2 Timothy 2, verse 13. And if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. There's only one thing you can really rest your case in, and that's that God is exactly who he says he is and does exactly what he says he's going to do. So with God's faithfulness also comes his word and our escape. His word and our escape. Jesus used Deuteronomy to escape God's word, Deuteronomy, to escape his temptation. And you and I have that same privilege, except there's a difference. If you know Christ, it's inscribed upon the fleshly tablets of your heart. You hear the yes, no. You know what's right and wrong. But friend, you and I, have to choose what's right. Choose sin, it's insatiable, it will never be satisfied. And at the end of the day, you will be empty. Like the Marilyn Monroe's, and we can name others, the only course out is the last and ultimate self-will, which is suicide. Which is reason that the great Christian psychiatrist said, I guess the wage of sin is death. Let's not end on that note. Let's go to John 16, 33. John 16, 33. And we'll close with this. I've told you these things, he's speaking to his disciples, so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you have trouble. But, but, Take heart, exclamation point. Take heart. I have overcome the world. You may be tempted, but he's faithful. He stands beside you, and he has pioneered the way, the book of Hebrews says, to life everlasting. But you got to choose it. Now, for all of us who struggle with passions and desires in life, let me share this final word and we'll be done. This might help. Find a godly passion. Listen to me. Find a godly passion greater than your sinful passion and focus on.